Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Farsafe Marine's webinar series. My name is Rich Shortall. I'm the executive coordinator of Farsafe Marin. The Farsafe Marin webinar series is created by members of our educational committee, it includes representatives of fire agencies, environmental groups, UC Marin master gardeners, and various subject matter experts. The project is funded and supported by the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority. It's designed to help all of us to understand and prepare for the threat of wildfire here in Marin. If we all do our part, we can minimize risks, save lives and property. We encourage all of you to participate tonight by providing questions in writing through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Questions that can't be addressed during tonight's presentation will be answered and posted on the FireSafe Marin website. We ask that you please keep your questions related to tonight's topic. And uh, tonight's presentation will again be recorded and available on our Fire Safe Marin YouTube channel, which includes a lot of other very exciting wildfire educational videos. We really do encourage you to take a look at that. We're happy tonight to have two great presenters. The first one is Battalion Chief Todd Lando with the Central Marin Fire Department. He will discuss the various defensible space zones and the applicable fire codes and ordinance um, covering those zones. He'll be followed by Bonnie Morse from Bonnie Bee and Company. Bonnie's both a beekeeper and a certified arborist. She's going to discuss ways to make your landscape more fire safe, resistant to fires, support biodiversity, and protect valuable habitat for birds, animals, and pollinators. Following their presentations, we're going to give you just a very brief introduction to an important new program from the California Office of Emergency Services called LISTOS. LISTOS means ready in Spanish. It teaches you to facilitate your own preparedness, preparedness programs, and it provides free educational resources designed to resonate with diverse populations and available in multiple languages. As you'll see from the video, there's a wealth of material on their website, and it gives you some basic ideas of how to get started. When we're done with all of this, we'll be, have a roundtable discussion, bringing back both Bonnie and Todd and myself, and we'll try to respond to some of the questions maybe we didn't get to earlier in the evening. So with that, I would like to welcome Todd Lando and invite him to give us our, his presentation. Todd? Thanks, Rich. Thanks again, everybody, for the invitation to be here. <sighs> Appreciate uh, the, the big groups that show up even during what, what really should be a, a quiet spring for us, but I know it's, it's dry out. I know we're already getting concerned about wildfire season this year. and. Uh, uh, as we get into spring, this is really the time you can make changes around your property. We're going to talk tonight, I'm going to talk about defensible space, um, but very specifically, I'm going to talk about some of the myths that surround defensible space. In a lot of ways, these are the, the frequently asked questions, the commonly asked questions that, that, that we respond to um, in the fire service, uh, where we, we see that the community needs a little extra help understanding uh, uh, the issues that they're actually confronted with. I'm going to open up uh, with a quick video, but, but uh, again, we're talking myth busting tonight, defensible space. This is about two minutes. We usually don't show action videos, but I want you to watch what happens here and listen to what the firefighters have to say. Just let this thing burn itself out right in here and try and keep it in check to right here so everybody else in this area can stay safe. Brother burn there in the Yeah, I hear you. If you ever need me to move, just put me out of the way. You're doing good, you're doing really good. Thank you. 
fairly close to the structure, but the good part about this oh, yeah, yeah. is the owner of the house he was obviously paying attention when someone told him, hey, you know, you really do need the physical space between vegetation and your structure. Defendable space gives us time. But you go out here to our to our north, there's just house after house after house that's just getting feet to crap right now. So I, I love that video uh, for a number of reasons. One, if that, that fire captain, if I ever meet him, I'm, I'm going to buy him a beer. Uh, he had the wherewithal to talk to a reporter in the middle of the, the thick of it, fighting a fire in Riverside County, uh, to talk to the reporter about defensible space and the importance of it. Uh, but but as you watch that video, you may not have seen that it touches on several of the myths that, that we're going to bust tonight. Um, not, not so much what the firefighter said, but, but what was happening in and around the space around that house. So uh, you probably picked up on the fact that that was not Marin County. Uh, I, I don't want you to look at that video and think that the space around that house is what we're asking homeowners to create in this landscape. It might've been an appropriate, it is an appropriate landscape for the desert area where that, that film was taken. Um, uh, but but it opens up this question that we get all the time. I, the, the feeling among a lot of people that I need to remove all of the vegetation around my house to create defensible space. Uh, nothing could be farther from the truth. In that video, you saw a house that had 30 feet of bare dirt around it. That, that may be what's necessary in certain places, uh, uh, you know, in the desert where there are 10 foot tall walls of manzanita or, uh, uh, or uh, mesquite growing. Uh, in Marin County, in most of Northern California, most of the Western US, a beautiful lush green landscape, the kind of landscaping you see in Better Homes and Garden is exactly what we wanna see. That, that is a defensible space. So th there's absolutely no truth to the myth that we need to create, uh, we need to remove all vegetation from the space around our homes. We need to think carefully about the vegetation around our homes. We need to focus on things like maintenance, we need to focus on, on careful plant selection and, and uh, the landscaping itself. We're going to touch on that. Another, another myth we, uh, we hear all the time, defensible space is all about the types of vegetation. I think of a wood shingled house, that, that vegetation absolutely needs to go. There's no doubt about it. That's a poor choice in vegetation, but that's not all that, that defensible space is. The choice in vegetation is one small aspect of creating defensible space. We like to think, this is the one sidebar I'm gonna do here because it's directly related. We like to think of the, the, uh, the concept of firescaping. This is when we combine landscaping and hardscaping to create a space around our house. Defensible space is not just about the plants, it's about the design, it's about the way you maintain that landscape, it's about the features that you build into your landscape, the permanent features, not just the plants. This is a great photograph just uh, two years ago at the Kincaid Fire in Sonoma County, how showing uh, uh, very clearly how a landscaping feature, in this case a retaining wall, is helping direct heat away from the house. Um, if you look closely, you'll see that there's a firefighter there protecting the house. That's going to come up again and again during today's uh, presentation. We hear from people all the time that defensible space, creating defensible space, improving their landscaping is going to ruin their landscaping. They don't want to see the change in their landscaping. This, uh, I, I suspect that the person uh, uh, whose home this is is in our audience tonight. Um, one of the best examples we've seen of a transformation in a yard. Here's the before photo, here's the after photo. Same photo, same angle. The issues that, that this homeowner were confronted with were an old wooden staircase that was attached to the house, several inches of bark mulch, a bamboo hedge towards the back of the house and along the side of the house, a dead tree in the yard, and, and frankly, uh, you know, some, some areas that weren't landscaped, weren't particularly attractive, which changed to this. Attractive use of succulents, use of uh, decorative gravel within five feet of the structure. In my yard, I'll, I, I will be safe. Again, we're not asking anybody to clear all of the vegetation in their yard, but we want people to know that a defensible space, again, not just about 
the landscaping or the uh, the vegetation in your yard, the landscaping features, the other features, the combustible materials in your yard can have just as big an impact on whether your home's going to survive. In this case, a fence. We've talked uh, at length about the importance of protecting fences, making sure that fences are not attached to your structure. Um, this is a great example of a yard that has fantastic defensible space in most senses, but that fence carried the fire directly to the home. This is probably the big one, the mother of all myths. My neighbor's tree is an extreme fire hazard. I have an inbox full of messages that say just that. People write to us, they call us, they're concerned about their neighbor's tree, oftentimes concerned about their own trees. We want people to look down, not necessarily up when they're thinking about their defensible space. This is a photograph uh, of the Scripps Ranch community in Southern California. Uh, this is a neighborhood that was surrounded by eucalyptus trees. Every home had trees in their side yard, their front yard, in their backyard, and every tree survived. None of the homes survived. This gets to the, the, uh, the point we make often that your homes are most vulnerable to embers. We'll touch on that again in a minute. But uh, I, I want you to focus on the trees. Again, these are eucalyptus trees. These are a tree that we're concerned about because of the potential fire hazard, because of what falls out of them, because of the dead vegetation that, uh, that builds up around the base of them. Believe it or not, these eucalyptus trees were very well maintained. They helped keep the fire out of the treetops the maintenance work that had been done. And what we had was essentially a fuel break around the community that kept the wildfire from, from burning directly into the community, but it does nothing to stop the embers. And the homes were vulnerable to the embers that landed on them. Our next myth, if the fire department just forced everyone to create defensible space, we'd all be safe. It's not the case. <sighs> the fire department does have some ability to enforce the defensible space codes. There are laws related to defensible space and the maintenance of your landscape. That's how I'm gonna close up tonight, talking about those laws. But I want people to understand that the law does not prescribe a perfect defensible space around homes. In fact, many of the things that you need to do to maintain a defensible space, zone zero, which we covered in last month's uh, webinar, the fence that I just showed you burning, the landscaping features that are critical to maintaining a defensible space are not required by law. The law requires that we address certain, certain issues related to around our property and that we do a minimal amount of maintenance on our trees. It does not prescribe a perfect defensible space. And I think we should all be striving in Marin and Northern California to create what's essentially a perfect defensible space around our homes. Uh, Bonnie is going to touch on this in detail, but I think it's important to, to note that defensible space is not harmful to the environment, although there is a myth floating around that, that creating defensible space creates harm to animals, plants, insects, and the landscape. This is not the case. You can have a healthy native landscape that's lush, well-maintained, and fire resilient. There's, there's uh, absolutely no reason that you can't have a healthy landscape, a healthy environment around your home that's attractive to birds and pollinators and animals, and that's also resilient to wildfires. Myth, defensible space means cutting down trees. This is not the case. Again, we're not talking about the trees when we talk about defensible space, at least not the canopies of them. We want you to look towards the ground. We want you to look at, look at the space around those trees. We want you to maintain a healthy natural forest around your property. This is an example of a restoration that's occurring in Marin County around a, a community that's adjacent to a, a large area of open space. This is a community that was losing their native oak woodlands to invasive species like French broom, scotch broom, and acacia. By restoring the meadow that normally had surrounded these oak trees, they're restoring the health of the native oak forest and they're improving their fire resiliency. Defensible space and a healthy forest are not mutually exclusive. This is a big one, drifting a little bit away from defensible space, but I promise I'll tie it back in. I, I only need to worry about defensible space on red flag days or I only need to worry about wildfires on red flag days. And this is absolutely not the case. You need to worry about 
your defensible space, your home safety and your family safety at all times during the fire season, which is, is uh, in many cases essentially year round now. I wanna show you a video now of a, a wildfire burning outside of the red flag conditions that we've warned you about so much. What you see here is a small fire. This fire is probably not even one quarter of an acre. It started near a roadside. This is uh, near Sparks, Nevada. There's no wind. This is not a red flag day. This is an average day in the summer, similar to the weather conditions we see almost every day in Marin in the summer. I've been told that eight homes were destroyed by this quarter acre fire. And there was one element, maybe two elements missing from this community. There was no defensible space. We've, this is about a 15 minute video. Uh, some fantastic lessons to be learned from watching the whole video. But what's absolutely apparent is that these homes did not have even the minimal defensible space. They had not cut their grass, the annual grasses that dry each summer. Those grasses grew directly underneath the back porches of these homes and eight people lost their homes because of it. <sighs> this is where we start to make a little transition in our thought. The myth is defensible space means my house fend itself. The defensible and defensible space refers to firefighters. Uh, defensible space as a concept is, goes back decades and it really goes back to creating a space that's safe for firefighters to operate. It creates a, a space around a home where firefighters can protect the home, the firefighters do the defending and the defensible space makes it safe for them to do that. Um, without the firefighters in many of these photos, in fact, I, I pointed them out to you, it, it, those homes may not have survived. We talk now, uh, in, in fact, this is a concept that's uh, really growing, coming of age in Marin County, but we talk sometimes about survivable space, creating a space around your home where your, fire, where your home might survive a fire, even if no firefighters are there. Uh, that's important because based on uh, you know, the experiences of the last five years, we have seen communities that were impacted by fires so quickly that we weren't able to get enough firefighters there to, do, uh, to, to make an impact. Um, uh, that, that's gonna continue to happen and those conditions may get worse, but we're still aiming to create a space where firefighters can safely protect your home incredibly important to think about. <clears throat> this isn't just rehashing one of the previous slides. The myth is if the fire department would just enforce the law, everybody would be safe. <clears throat> Some of you may have received a hazard notice that looks like the one on the screen. This is in many ways a law enforcement issue. There are laws on the books. There have been laws on the books in Marin County for over a hundred years relating to defensible space. But as we saw earlier, the number of homes, the number of properties that require defensible space and the fact that the issues that are, that are uh, addressed by the law itself are not, uh, are not a complete picture of what threatens your home makes it incredibly difficult to simply enforce the law and assume that everybody's going to be safe. That's just not the case. I'm going to transition now into talking about what that law is and how it applies and how we can help overcome some of those myths when we're, when we're thinking about defensible space around our homes and defensible space as a law. In California, the, uh, there are a variety of, of laws and codes and ordinances that address defensible space. The California Public Resources Code uh, 4291, which applies all homes and state responsibility areas in the state. And in Marin County, we've also adopted the California Fire Code. Both of these laws address the same set of issues in slightly different ways. They, they, uh, they work together, they're complementary, they're important. Um, uh, and they address the defensible space around your home uh, in, in using this theory of zones. So uh, in the, the, the quickest uh, description I can give you. Zone zero, zero to five feet. Again, last month's uh, uh, presentation, our webinar. Zone zero, 
is going to be addressed by a new law, a change to California Public Resources Code that'll come into effect starting this year and be phased in over the next three years. And that's going to address a, a number of items that we know now are, are extremely important to the survival of your home, the combustibles within five feet of your walls. Zone one, five feet to 30 feet is a space where the, the CAL FIRE and the state law addresses it directly as the lean, clean and green zone. This is an area where we want to see no dead vegetation at all. Grasses must, must be cut to three inches or less. Trees need to be limbed up six feet from the ground or a third the height of the tree. And we wanna see spacing put between shrubs and plants. And that's it under the law. Nothing about removing those trees, nothing about removing all of that vegetation. It's about maintenance. It's about lifting the canopy of the trees up and cutting your grass in that space. Things like combustible mulches, uh, landscaping features are not addressed in the law. They're not required by the law. They're not disallowed by the law. From 30 to 100 feet, the law requires that you provide basic maintenance, not removal of trees, removal of dead vegetation only. You don't necessarily under the law need to cut your dry grasses from 30 to 100 feet, although we strongly recommend that. We want to see shrubs. We want to see green, lush vegetation. We want to see healthy plants. We want to see in the number of invasive plants, but none of those things are required by law. What is required in that space is the removal of dead vegetation. So from zero to 100 feet from your structure or to your property line, whichever is closer, we're looking at maintenance under the law, simply removing dead vegetation. <clears throat> when we look at this in relation to how homes actually ignite, I'm gonna close with this. It's a reminder that 60 to 90% of homes lost during wildfires ignite from the embers that land on them or within five feet of them. There's nothing in the current law that addresses this issue. So when we talk about defensible space, when we talk about defensible space as a law, when we look at it as a law enforcement issue, we're really focusing on 10% of the homes that are lost during wildfires. But it's important to note that 100% of the homes that don't have defensible space are vulnerable during a wildfire. So the statistics can be used uh, to, to tell you many things. They can tell you that 60 to 90% of the homes are gonna, that are lost during a wildfire are going to look like this one during the campfire in paradise. This is a home that burned down due to embers that landed on it. It did not have what I would consider to be adequate defensible space. It even has a juniper shrub in the front yard. The juniper shrub didn't burn, but the house did. What does that tell you? A number of things that you've learned in our recent webinars. Here's a home, the inverse of that photograph. Here's a home that had, had uh, good defensible space within 30 feet of the structure. That it had close attention to the maintenance. This home survived when the landscape around it was burned critical issues, important things for you to think about. I hope that uh, we brought some understanding to some of these myths that surround defensible space. And I hope that uh, folks go home with a better understanding of what they need to focus on around their homes. Thanks everyone. Well, great, I wanna thank you, Todd. That was a great presentation. I can kind of tell because we didn't get a lot of questions. So I think you responded very well to everything. Um, I will remind the audience, um, while I talked to Todd for a couple of minutes here, while you, if you still have a question, please put it in the Q&A and we'll make sure we get it to Todd. Um, I think the idea of myth busting was great. We're gonna try to make that more of a theme as we go forward because unfortunately, there are a lot of misunderstandings out there and I think you did a really good job of setting everybody straight on that. Um, maybe you can help me with this, but I'd like to give a little bit of a plug for a program that's coming to everybody in Marin, which is the Chipper program. So I think a lot of people were aware that we had a pretty ambitious curbside Chipper program where you clear the material, our Chipper comes up right on the street, chips the material, takes it away from you. Um, we'll say free of charge, although obviously the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority is using your tax dollars to help pay for that program, but we found it to be extremely productive. But the program now has been approved by the MWPA for the upcoming season. 
and the schedule is available on our website. And you can also go to chipperday.com slash Marin to register for a chipper pile. So Todd, do you think this will be of assistance to people? Absolutely. It's a great program. I've been promoting it for years uh, and, and I'm really proud of where you guys have taken it in the last year that the, the, the infusion of funding from uh, the MWPA has been a huge help. That This program uh, really helps people with uh, create their defensible space. We, we've uh, for years have marveled at how much vegetation people can fit in the back of their Prius, but we recognize uh, that, that uh, not everybody has the ability to haul their vegetation to a green waste facility. Our green cans oftentimes aren't enough to, uh, to haul away all the vegetation that we need to cut to maintain our, our defensible space. So the chipper program lets people dispose of large quantities of vegetation. This is vegetation that, that uh, requires maintenance. Again, we're not asking you to clear your whole property. We want you to follow the steps for maintenance that we provide on the website and in our webinar series. Uh, put it out on your curbside. Uh, 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 the new for this year, there's really no limit on the amount of vegetation that we'll take. Um, it does, if you have a pile larger than eight feet by four feet by four feet, it requires pre-approval from FireSafe Marin, just so we know that we're going to be coming to a big pile so it doesn't slow our crews down. But it's just a great program, a huge cost saver for homeowners, and, and it makes a difference in the community when we're out there fighting fires. Great. Thanks, Todd. So I see a number of questions have come through, but to be honest, most of them are related to home hardening. And I just remind the audience that we're, the topic is more on the defensible space tonight. The last several uh, webinars we've done very much focused on your questions about roofs and decking and trek and wood products and whatnot. If you go to our website, uh, or I'll probably better yet go to our YouTube channel, you'll see those are easy to find and there's a lot of detail and you'll hear Todd and Steve Quarles and Jack Cohen, some of our experts really getting into detail about that. So I'll, I'll let you go down, uh, go down to that for, for that. Um, maybe one uh, last question, which is the, um, there's some new legislation from the state related to zone zero. Um, how do you yeah. see that legislation impacting us here in Marin? So the details of how that the, the new regulations are going to impact us are still being worked out by the California uh, uh, Board of Forestry. Their meetings are all online. I would encourage people who are interested to participate. Um, I find their meetings fascinating. They're, they're working on guidelines for what will be required in zone zero. They're calling it an ember defense zone or a non-combustible zone. So uh, I would expect that they're going to follow the science, which says that we should reduce the number of combustibles within five feet of a structure. I think you're going to see some uh, some discussion about combustible wood mulches within five feet of structures. I think there will be some allowance for some vegetation that's low growing and well maintained in that space. I think you're going to see uh, some some discussion or some requirements related to storing other types of combustibles within that space. We already don't allow firewood to be stored during fire, uh, fire season within 30 feet of structures, but I think you're gonna see us address some of the other kinds of things that people might store underneath their decks or on their decks or adjacent like in their side yards around their house. So uh, it, it's yet to be seen exactly how it, it, this is gonna fall, but we know that it's gonna make an impact on whether homes survive or don't survive during fires. Great, thanks Todd. Well, we need to move on tonight. I see some good questions are coming in. We'll be back at the round table. So we'll try to pick up some of the ones that, that we missed here. And I do really wanna thank Todd for a, a great presentation and thanks to the audience for beginning to suggest a lot of really good questions. So with that, I would like to bring on Bonnie Morse. Bonnie, I'm get here. you out there. Hey, Bonnie, good to see you. Thank you so much for being with us. So I'll let Bonnie describe her background to you, but we're very fortunate to have her here and we'll get a little uh, different take on some of this. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Bonnie. Thank you. Yeah, I, I've uh, worked with plants and animals in one capacity or another for most of my life. My husband and I became professional beekeepers though about 10 years ago. Um, uh, before that, as, as Rich mentioned earlier, I am still an ISA certified arborist and a horticulturalist. 
Um, and I'm just very concerned about what I see in the world around us, these challenges we're facing. I mean, not only with increased fire risk, but loss of biodiversity and conservation of resources. So thank you very much for having me here tonight. And I will try to get through this quickly so we can move on to round table and questions. So I'm, I'm just gonna start with, um, we, we thought I, uh, uh, Fire Safe Marin produced a video. Um, it's six minutes, and I think it very succinctly just uh, talks about many of the things I would have talked about tonight. So let me just share my screen and we will watch that. Oh, here we go. Sorry, here we go. It's July 2019, and after a couple of years of very devastating fires uh, Hi, in California. I'm Bonnie Morse. I'm a beekeeper and a certified arborist. Today we're going to be discussing how to make your landscape both more resistant to wildfires while also protecting our pollinators. Increasing fire dangers are not the only crisis we are facing with the changing climate. We are facing unprecedented threats to biodiversity. In the long run, loss of pollinators could create a shift in vegetation with plant reproduction favored by wind pollination. Wind pollinated species include grasses and pine trees that tend to be more fire prone. Long before European honeybees were introduced in the colonies in 1622, 4,000 species of native bees, in addition to butterflies and other insects, pollinated flowers in what is now the U.S. The majority of these bees, 90 of which call the San Francisco Bay Area home, are solitary and ground nesting. Commercial farming practices, which provide much of the food consumed by the population, have had detrimental impacts to pollinators over the past 80 years. In the urban environment, loss of habitat, pesticide use, and prioritizing plant aesthetics over function has also impacted populations. But urban areas are also in a position to transform quicker than areas dominated by commercial agricultural production and could potentially hold the key to protecting biodiversity. Landscapes that are more fire resistant don't have to be biological dead zones. We can have both fire resistant and ecologically beneficial yards. We are being asked to remove plants that tend to have a higher fire risk. Well-maintained and irrigated plants are almost always safer than ones that are drought stressed or poorly maintained. That said, some species are more difficult to properly maintain due to characteristics like high leaf litter and dead woody interiors as they age. Many of these plants do not support biodiversity and are non-natives. So removing them and replacing with better selections can be a win-win. Transforming your garden into a fire smart and biodiverse landscape may seem like a daunting task. So make a plan to tackle it in steps to maximize your maintenance dollars and minimize your time investment. Start with undesirable plants in the zone zero. Within five feet of structures, the ones that FireSafe Marin recommends be removed due to their tendency to build up dried material. An example are these black acacia trees overhanging this garage. This invasive species has a lot of dried material in canopy and on the ground during fire season. The benefits of shading the garage from afternoon sun and some bird nesting activity do not justify the fire hazard and limited biodiversity they help to support. There were much better options for this location. The trees were removed and replaced with Ceanothus, a native tree, and smaller natives including Salvias and Douglas Iris. Ceanothus is an early blooming plant that evolved with native bees and supports them with nectar and pollen after their post-winter emergence. In addition, it's relatively slow growing and can be easily kept pruned at an appropriate distance from the garage. There's still work to do around this planting bed. The vine needs to be cut back, and ideally the fence would be replaced with a non-combustible material. But take it one step at a time and prioritize the biggest hazards to your home. From a bee perspective, density of plant type is important. Bees prefer to forage on a single plant type on any single foraging trip. Larger patches, at least three feet by three feet when the plants are mature, will attract the most bees. If you like the look of dense plantings and the beneficial insects they support, you can take advantage of annuals that emerge in the spring when it's cool and wet and will reseed and die back prior to fire season. In fact, other than ensuring dried planting materials removed by fire season, you may have to do nothing else, including watering. You can collect seeds from annual plants that you and the pollinators enjoy. You'll save money. Just collect the seeds when dry and store in a paper bag. You can distribute in desired locations in the fall or trade seeds with friends. 
That's it. Removing plants with little ecological benefit, but that create a fire risk can create opportunity. Oleanders, not native to North America, provide little ecological benefit to native species. In addition, the hedge laddered between the front privet hedge and the home. In this case, a loquat tree was transplanted from a bed next to the house and was placed where an oleander hedge was removed. The loquat tree provides pollen and nectar for pollinators in late fall and fruit in the spring. Try to select a variety of plants that provide pollen and nectar during different times of the year. To maximize the benefits to pollinators, it's often best to plant the straight species as opposed to cultivars. Many cultivars have been selected and bred for aesthetics, but would be unable to reproduce without human assistance because their pollen and nectar is unavailable to pollinators. If you need help, just observe which plants you see the bees visiting. They'll let you know what they prefer. A final comment. One of the easiest ways you can protect pollinators is to eliminate chemical use in the garden. A pesticide is a pesticide, and you may be harming beneficial insects as well as polluting our waterways. For advice on less toxic alternatives, reach out to Our Water, Our World. Fire safety can be both beautiful and support biodiversity. We can have it all with careful planning. Okay, so I'm going to move on just to make a couple other points. And then we'll get to our Q&A. And I just want to show you a picture. This is that planting bed one year later um, where the acacia were removed. Um, the vine still needs to be dealt with. That's true. Um, but here we have a lot of annuals coming up. The ceanothus is starting to grow. You can't really see all the native salvias in there uh, because of the annuals but they're gonna die back again for fire season. So that green, beautiful, lush landscaping is gonna um, go, go into a place where we've got you know, uh, plant separation, which is what we wanna see during fire season. But in the meantime, um, there's all these beautiful uh, native annuals that, that the bees, many native bees are taking care of. So, you know, Todd talked about this as well, like many people in their concern for uh, fire safety are concerned with some of their mature trees. But the fact is that mature trees have many benefits and, and the fire professionals here really re recognize that they do have these benefits. I mean, they include, they can shade and cool our homes, which can reduce our energy use and cost. Um, they protect these understory plants and insect communities that grew up in their shade in these shadows, um, where if you remove them quickly, you could, you know, really decimate that. Um, their established root system can help with slope stability and can also help with minimizing erosion, not just because of that slope st stability through their roots, but also, you know, raindrops in hitting the leaves before they hit the ground and slowing that is going to help um, with our erosion problems. It could reduce soil desiccation during hot summer months. Um, so less water for the plants that are underneath there. And also, um, you know, possibly more fire resistance because there's uh, more moisture in those soils, um, you know, with less um, watering that we have to do. And also carbon sequestration. So mature trees have a lot of value. And as Todd said, you know, usually if they're limbed up and just dead wood and properly maintained, and from the pictures he showed, um, they really can be quite fire resistant. Now, um, there, there sometimes can be um, undesirable trees. And sometimes, just like with those black acacias, sometimes while limbing up may be a preferred option in deadwooding, it may not always be an option, especially um, close to structures. So in both these situations, very close to structures, and limbing them up in an appropriate distance, you know, it's not just six feet above the ground, you want to get it about 10 feet above a roof line and away from those buildings. So trying to limb up these trees that were planted way too close to structures would actually create an unsafe tree condition. Um, so in these conditions, yes, removal might be best. Now, if you have an undesirable tree, um, that you have in a location, um, 
what you what might want to do, and I apologize, I'm not sure why this is here. What we want you to consider is succession planting. So if you have a tree in both these conditions, this is a, a green wattle acacia, very large tree that has provided a lot of shade for the home. It's a southern exposure, really cools it during the summer, presents that uh, prevents that desiccation that I talked about. On this side here, on the right picture, we have a blackwood acacia, um, so not desirable. It's more than 30 feet away from the structure, so really doesn't have to be removed, but at the same time is not providing much ecological benefit, even though it is providing some shading for the understory plants that have grown up around it. Um, in both these situations, if you really do want to remove a tree, what you can do is um, plant a tree, a preferred species, under those trees before you actually remove the, um, the, the established tree. And in this case, there's two different trees here that have been planted. And in six to seven years, those root systems will be established. This is very similar to a forest situation. Um, so the, that root system get, can get established and, um, and that tree is really ready to, to, to take a prominent position once those trees are removed and which can also help protect those understory plants and insect communities and lots of things. So um, if you do a succession planting, um, an undesirable tree ideally will be removed in fall or winter when you have shorter days, um, cooler temperatures, um, that's going to cause less stress to the understory plants as well as the succession tree. Um, you'll be outside of bird nesting season and you're getting that natural rainfall that's going to help irrigate the plants below and get them through. You know, we really do have an opportunity right now. Um, a lot of our landscapes have very few native plants. They do not help um, support biodiversity very well. And many of them, like some of the species that uh, Todd showed in his, the um, Italian cypress, our bamboo, the junipers, um, they're just more fire prone. They may be more they may be also drought tolerant, but the fire prone doesn't really work. So removing those and replacing with native plants is really a win-win for everyone. Um, here I've got a great resource that you can check out is calscape.org. This is the California Native Plant Society put this together. And you can actually look by zip code to find plants that are native to your very specific area. This is a picture I took yesterday um, just north of the um, Petaluma Point Reyes Road of the Nicasio Reservoir, which is really more like a, a pond at this point. Um, you know, you can see our beautiful lush green hills. This, this should be out to the edges here. I mean, we're here at the end of winter going into our dearth or will be going into our dearth. This should be full. It's not full at all. So how do we conserve water while we're thinking about planting? Um, well, fall, fall is an ideal planting time here. Um, we have two seasons of root growth, their spring um, for the fall and spring. So with our dry summer Mediterranean climate by planting in the fall, your plants get the benefit of a fall root growth season, um, as well as the winter rains for irrigation and then spring root growth before we go into our summer dearth period. Um, so especially this year, as we look ahead to how we can not only maintain fire safe landscapes, um, but, but also conserve water, that's a great way to do it. This is a great time to be uh, planning for what you need to remove or clean up and then thinking ahead to fall and planning for what plants you want to um, encourage. And I, I just want to encourage you, you know, when we really think about a lot of our native plants, rather than removing them like our native bacris, our coyote bush, which when it's older can have a lot of woody debris that is not so fire safe. Um, however, it's such an important, these native plants, um, all these insects that evolve with them and our, our, our even our non-native honeybees, so important. Um, as a beekeeper, when I teach beginning beekeeping and I talk about the seasons, I talk about the season, which in our area is basically February to, to May. Um, right now, when conditions are optimal with lots of nectar and pollen, then we have our summer dearth, and then we have coyote bush season. 
and that's a whole season in and of itself. It's so important. Um, there are at least 400 different insect species um, that utilize this plant. So rather than removing it, um, you can keep it in a pretty fire safe manner. For those older plants like this one that has a lot of dead wood in here, you can literally cut it to the ground and it will, um, it will come back from the roots and, and from the, the old the planting stocks that you cut it down to. Um, and the young growth, these really waxy thick leaves are relatively fire resistant. So you, you can maintain things in a way um, that are maintain plants that are very important to our biodiversity in a fire safe manner. And for more information on fire safe landscaping, um, you can check out the, the Marin Master Gardeners website. They've recently updated it with a lot of great information. And please tune in to next month's webinar um, when Faye Mark will be talking about this. So, you know, in reality, all plants can burn. It's really how you maintain them. Um, and so you can learn more through the Master Gardeners. It's tough that when we talk about a balance because insect nesting and overwintering habitat um, it is kind of not compatible with some of our um, wanting to clean things up for fire hazards. This here is clearly not okay. And this picture I should say was taken on the East Coast. So a little bit different scenario. We do need to keep things maybe not so clean to help our insects. Um, a lot of them, that overwintering habitat is so important in the leaf litter, um, and, and in, you know, brush and debris. Um, those dried plant stalks, as shown here, a lot of our native bees will nest in them, um, in those dried plant stalks. They'll, they'll lay their eggs and their pupa will overwinter in them. But keep it away from um, 30 feet away from the structures and do it in islands that don't provide continuous fuel, uh, fire fuels but important to keep it around if you can. Another important just environmental consideration is erosion and slopes. You really don't have to choose between fire and lands landslides. You just have to plan carefully. We have very heavy clay soils here. And um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of benefits to having vegetation on them. So really be careful, especially in the fall, you don't wanna be clearing all, all your um, vegetation and, and taking it down where you could potentially create a hazardous landslide situation. A lot of us live on slopes here. So be very concerned about how you allow your water to slow, spread, and sink into the soil. And if you're in between um, um, finishing a, a, a project where you're taking out plants and letting new ones get established, you know, there's a lot of different methods, including using straw wattles as shown here to really help slow that water down so that you don't create a hazardous condition. And one last note I wanna make is if you are concerned about creating, um, making your property habitat for biodiversity, the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Con Conservation has an excellent um, habitat assessment guide for pollinators, which will kind of help you look at your yard and grade it and see where you can do better. So thank you very much. And I think we can move on. All right. Well, great. Thank you very much, Bonnie. That was a great, uh, a great presentation. One thing that I don't want to lose sight of, and I learned from you fairly recently, could you just go over the, um, the difference between pollination from bees and winds and why that has an impact on wildfire? So a, a lot of the insect pollinated species are actually less fire prone. So when we think about the things that are more fire prone and on the fire safe marin site that we worry about the grasses and the pines and things, those are all wind pollinated species. And even though bees might collect pollen from them, um, they're not responsible for their pollination. So when we look at like, you know, a generation, two generations, three generations down the line, this probably won't impact all of us. But if we don't protect our pollinators now and protect those species, those plant species that are, are more, uh, are less fire prone, um, but they're insect pollinated, we could actually be setting up future generations with more wildfire risk. Um, and, and it doesn't have to be that way. You know, pollinators, 
Um, you know, Rich, you and I have had this conversation. I mean, fire uh, knowledge and research goes back a millennia because people have been dealing with fires for a long time. There's a lot of research. I mean, there's fire departments in every community. There's a lot of uh, local resources and money that goes into education and our fire departments. As far as um, uh, insects go, you know, we really didn't start having a problem with losing biodiversity and losing insects until post-World War II. So we're only 80 years into this. We hardly know anything about most insect species. The most studied insect in California would be the monarch butterfly. It's one of the few insects we actually have some kind of historical data on their population. And that only goes back about 30 years. And 30 years ago, um, they were counting about 2 million monarchs in their overwintering grounds. And we're now down to 2,000 this last winter. So you have to imagine that that's happening to every insect species and every pollinator species, but we just don't know anything about that historical data, but that's really shocking. <laughs> well, we're all learning a lot. That's why we're here tonight. Um, a couple of questions real quick before we get to maybe some takeaways from you. Um, these probably would be better for Faye and Mark coming in next month, but you probably, since they're here tonight, we'll see if you want to deal with them. One of them is the cyanosis attract or concentrate ticks? I don't know about ticks. I do not know about ticks, but I will say that Ceanothus is a really important, just like Physalia and some of the early bloomers, you know, are native pollinators of which I said in that talk that there were 90, but I've since learned, um, you know, and that was from the UC Berkeley research that's been done. Um, but I believe in, in, a, in a Mount Tamalpais study, they found that there were about 300 species here in Marin. So um, a lot of these, you know, these, these bees have most solitary ground nesting, most, you know, unless you're really paying attention, you're probably not gonna see them because there's not very many on your flowers. Um, but they're, they're gonna coincide with their, the plants they evolved with. So Ceanothus is a really important plant, um, one of the earliest bloomers, and um, it actually coincides with the emergence, uh, the overwinter emergence of a lot of our native bees. So it's a great place to, to watch. And um, I, I'm not, like I said, I don't know about the tick issue, but I know that it's really important for our, our bumblebees to get their, their new colony set up for the season. All right, thanks. And let's see, I think we got time for um, one more, which is, can you recommend a low growing green ground cover that could provide green hydrated space without a lot of mowing and maintenance? Yeah, I have a few on a plant list, although, and I also know the Marin Master Gardeners do. Um, yeah, um, off the top of my head, I know some of the ones that I like um, that are, are considered a little more weedy because the bees really like them. So I would recommend people go to my website and look at my planting list with lawn alternatives. Um, time is one of them, um, but also the Marin Master Gardeners has, has, has some information too on that. So maybe we can put um, your website address in our uh, like Q&A to the audience so they know that because I believe you um, you do have a lot of resources there that people would be interested in, huh? I'll put that in, yeah. Great. All righty. Okay, um, before we move on, do you have some takeaways that you might wanna leave for everybody? Yeah, so some key ones are, you know, remove exotic, this is the low hanging fruit. Um, remove exotic plants that are more fire prone. So the blackwood acacia, the juniper, the bamboo, the Italian cypress, and replace it with native plants. The native plants are gonna have the same kind of drought tolerant nature, but they're gonna support biodiversity at the same time where those other plants, which are more fire prone, per, per, uh, really, uh, don't support any biodiversity. Um, also just native plants play a really impo important role in preserving that biodiversity. I mean, they, the, in, the local insects have a relationship with them. So rather than remove them, maintain, um, maintain the established plants to reduce your fire risk. And, and again, uh, lots of information with the Master Gardeners and Faye will be talking about that next month. And you really do want to keep your mature trees. There's a lot of benefit to them. Um, so it, keep them, but limb them up and get rid of that deadwood. 
And, and again, planting in fall, you know, a lot of people, they think about spring is the perfect time for planting, but with our Mediterranean climate here in our area, actually the ideal time to plant is fall when they can take advantage of fall root growth, winter rains and spring root growth before it goes into our summer dearth period. Wonderful, thanks, Bonnie. So Bonnie will be coming back in just a few minutes with Todd and myself for a round table. We'll try to get to a couple more of the questions and come up with some general concepts. Gonna take a, just a quick little uh, change of scenario right now. And I'd like to bring up a very short video. As I mentioned earlier, this is to let you know about a new program from the California Office of Emergency Services called LISTOS. It's a general preparedness program tons of great resources and materials on their website. And the program is really designed to make sure that all Californians, in fact, have access to disaster preparedness information from all the communities, whatever your language is, whatever your background is. So this is just short. We'll have to take a quick look at it. And then um, uh, if you have questions about it, you can get uh, back to us at FireSafe Moran. Jen, you want to go ahead? A disaster can destroy anything in its path, except our will to survive. This is California, where our neighbors are our family. They have our backs, and we have theirs. Our friends, our family, our community. We can all take small steps to stay safe. Because knowledge is the best shelter from any storm. And no matter where we live, how old or young we are, or what language we speak, no matter how others may see us. We're calling all people to connect, protect, and prepare. And we're not done until all Californians know what to do by staying informed. So we know what's coming and what we can do about it. Until all Californians know how to connect with the people we care about and protect them. And so all Californians get to safety if we need to and know what to bring and where to go. Or stay at home until it is safe to go out. Before the earth starts to shake, wildfire sparks and waters rise high. Get friends and neighbors to prepare. Because we're in this together. This is California. Listos, California. Now is our time to get ready. Great. Thank you, Jen. So let's bring uh, Todd and Bonnie back in together for a little bit of roundtable. And I just will add one last thing on the list of, and that is notice they focus neighbor helping neighbor, be prepared, get a kit and so forth. These are the themes that you've been hearing from FireSafe Marin for a very long time now. That's why we're very supportive of the program. We're all on the same, same page about this really. All righty, so we got Todd and Bonnie. Okay, um, one question that I had put off because I wanted to put it to the two of you was the one that came up with this, what is the best time to be clearing brush from uh, residents? Yeah, this, this is a good one. There, there's two parts to it. I'm going to let Bonnie speak to the, the, you know, the ecological concerns with brush clearing, especially as it might relate to uh, pollinators, and then I'll, I'll wrap up. Is that okay, Bonnie? Oh, that, that's fine. I mean, when I think of brush though, I mean, I'm thinking of dried materials. I mean, is that what you yeah. think of, Todd? Like, yeah, I, I do. I mean, I, you know, we call, it, we call it coyote brush and we both know how important that can be to pollinators. So, um, uh, you know, but, but brush can refer to any of the chaparral species, yeah. you, you know, I, um, I, it really in a lot of ways, any shrubs that are growing close together continuously. And, that, and that's where it goes back to that, like they, they are important because they're providing not only insect habitat, but bird habitat. Um, and, th and then it's really important about where it is, I guess, I mean, what you can speak to about where it is in proximity to the structure. So, you know, you can leave some of those piles, but, you know, for later in the season, but as long as they're not near structures, I mean, birds do need those. I see you wincing, but, um, <laughs> you know, can, I mean, yeah. Like, can we have them further away, to, you know, further away from structures and, and not continue you know, providing fuel ladders so that they can provide? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think I kind of maybe increasingly have heartache over just using terminology like clearing brush. Uh, you know, what, what's our goal here? 
we don't necessarily need to remove all of the brush to make our landscape more fire resistant. Um, uh, you know, maintaining the existing plants. I, I've seen uh, so many examples of, of manzanita that's maintained in some cases almost like a bonsai bush where the, the you know, a, a, a homeowner takes some extra time, makes sure they prune out the dead material as it builds up, keeps it relatively clean underneath it. And, and that, that would probably, uh, you know, classify as brush, but it's extremely fire resilient. If you let it go for 10 years without touching it, it's going to build up dead material and make it a, a significant fire hazard. So, so removal is not necessarily the only option to deal with the fire hazard. Uh, you know, and, and most, if we're talking about the sh different chaparral species, uh, it, it, they're, uh, it, they're really resilient. They'll, they'll withstand being pruned back, not necessarily removed, but cut into smaller clumps and separated. That's what Mother Nature and fire would have done periodically every, you know, every five to 20 years if we weren't putting all of those fires out. Um, I, so so I, I just, I want to caution us that we don't need to think about it as, as removal or clearing of all of the brush, but, but really maintenance of the brush, providing some separation, trying to mimic what Mother Nature might have done with fire. And, and leaving those messy piles further from structures like the wood. Yeah. Wood rats, which are really important for our, our, um, our owls and raptor population and, and for insect populations too, but just making sure that there's not continuous fuel ladders and keeping them further away from structures. Yeah, well, wood, wood rats are a great example. We, we actually saw a homeowner recently relocate a wood rats very carefully. Um, it was pretty impressive. I mean, I, they, they relocated it without really disturbing the nest. I thought that was impressive and they needed to. It was, it was within a few feet of the home. And, and you know, that, that's one of these challenges we run into. We, 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 we do have the law and we can't allow that within a few feet of the home. Relocating it seemed like a great idea and they were able to pull it off. I, that, it was a challenge. I wouldn't say it's for everybody, but-, but I, Impressive, that, that's dedication. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, one question that came up is that um, I think you did a great job explaining the importance of bees. And if we don't have bees, we don't have agriculture. Pollination is so critical. And it's not just At bees, the same time, moths and butterflies and all of our pollinators. Right. At the same time, if we plant our, and here's the question really that came up. If we plant our garden to be attracted to bees, there are people who feel like they're being driven inside because of the bees. Is that a realistic thing that people should be doing because there's bees out there or is it maybe not such no, a not thing? really. I mean, it, it's not really. I mean, again, yes, many bees will have stingers, but it's very unlikely that they're going to be defensive away from their nests. I mean, and the unfortunate thing is um, one of the most defensive and nuisance, uh, nuisance um, uh, species that we have is our yellow jackets that many people mistake for bees. You know, I mean, most of our native bees are solitary, ground nesting. They don't want to mess with anyone. They're just busy. They're just doing their job. And even the honeybees, you know, once you get them out there, if you plant for them, um, they're very efficient with it, with how they disperse themselves. So you're not necessarily going to see a whole lot more bees just because you plant for something because you know, whatever you're planting is only going to support so many. So you're not going to see an overabundance. You know, it, it's really interesting to me. I, for example, I was at a property the other day, a, a, a retail property, and I, I was looking at a female bumblebee queen, as well as a lot of other bees. And someone was walking by and I said, um, can I point something out to you? And they said, sure. And I, I pointed out the bumblebee queen. They would have never seen her otherwise nor did they even notice the hundreds of bees that were on this massive, you know, manzanita and cenothus next to each other. So um, yeah, it's, it's not really re realistic to have to worry about stings for most species. Um, you know, yellow jackets are a problem, not only for us, but for a lot of these bees that they prey on. Yeah. So okay, are so, yellow so, jackets so, a bee? No, no, the yellow jackets are wasp and they're very different because the, um, the honeybee, for example, has a barb stinger. So if it stings a mammal, it gets, uh, it, you know, it dies. Um, the yellow jacket has a smooth stinger. It can sting us repeatedly. They bite us. 
Um, and they're also omnivores. They eat meat and uh, they will also eat pollen and nectar. Um, so they're the ones that come to our barbecues in the late summer. And this goes back to what our Mediterranean climate. So um, they will build up to 5,000 to 10,000 in a nest by the end of summer. And when things are dry out there and there's nothing for them to eat and they're 5,000 to 10,000 strong, they're gonna be eating whatever they can. They're the ones that show up and, and create problems for us. And they're not pollinators. <laughs> they, can, they can be, yeah, they, they can be, but, but no. because they're omnivores, they're a problem. That's where they're a problem. So, you know, if, if you've got, if you read the bee books and most of them are written on the East Coast, they say yellow jackets aren't a problem for honeybees. That's absolutely false in our climate. You know, because, you know, Vermont, it's raining in August. There's still flowers, it's green. They have other sources of food. In our Mediterranean climate, you know, every, everything that's still around and not pupating, you know, during that time of year is, is looking for food. So I'm not gonna feel guilty to not be a fan of yellow jackets. Okay, fair Please enough. Don't be a fan, <laughs> yeah, no, no, don't feel guilty at all. Oh, hot tip, if you wait until yellow jackets are a problem to set up your traps, it's too late. <laughs> so I usually tell people get your yellow jacket traps out in February because they only overwinter as a queen. And so, okay, so, I, so I, I, I got this on good authority and we're recording this. Bonnie just told me that yellow jackets are a pollinator, but it's okay if I trap them. So I feel better about all the traps I put out. <laughs> yeah, but you got to get them out in February because you got to try to okay. trap the queens before they set up their colonies. So I already <laughs> missed the window. All right. So a little bit back more to the, uh, uh, fire issue. Um, one of the things that you addressed a little bit, Bonnie, and I think Todd may have said a bit about too, is slope stability. So it's not uncommon in Marin backyards with a bit of a slope for that slope often to be really overgrown heavily. And I don't mean with trees. It's very often that is the classic brushy overgrown area. Yeah. So what, um, what are your suggestions for a situation like that? Well, I mean, if you need to deal with it, fine, but be careful, maybe take it in stages if you can, um, you know, plan your succession, what plants you're going to go in there and like that picture showed and you maybe you need to use straw wattles for a few seasons while your new plants are getting established. You need to slow that water down. You need to direct it. You need to get it into the soil. Um, you don't just want it running straight down the slope. And I and I speak from experience because we are the low point of the the. Um, we're on a slope and we have a road behind us. And when water you know overflows. Um, we had terrible er erosion problems and for about five years while things were getting established and we got rid of the non-native grasses, we needed to use a lot of straw wattles to slow and redirect that water um, because if we didn't, we ended up with a lot of mud in our office. So, um, and, and you know, that's mud in the office isn't like a landslide. So you really need to plan for it. You want to have something on those slopes. You want those roots in there. Um, you want to you want to have that stability. So if you're getting rid of plants, again, plant in fall. You know, so get rid of those before fire season. If it's a it's a fire problem, um, plant in the fall. And um, you know, know that it's going to take a little while for them to get established, and use something like a straw wattle to help you slow that water. Yeah, I, I, I'd address it too. Uh, you know, it's important to, to remember that this nothing's black and white. Uh, the fire code makes specific exemptions for vegetation when it's needed to maintain stability on slopes. So th this is something I'd recommend you talk to your local fire department about, your local fire code official. If, if you are concerned about slope stability and think that, that uh, uh, removing vegetation to meet the minimum requirements of the fire code is going to uh, disrupt the stability, we can make exceptions for that, but we want to look at it and see if there aren't other ways to overcome it. Um, not, you know, a better plant selection, uh, there may be other options, but, but there are exceptions specifically for slope stability in the fire code. And Todd, that really speaks too to just like making a plan because a lot of these things are expensive. You know, yeah. removal of blackwood acacias is expensive. If you're thinking about some of this, and, and you know, so it's not just, it can be financially, it can also be expensive for biodiversity. 
And so when you look at like, I mean, this stuff didn't happen overnight. You know, many, of this, many of these issues in the vegetation, it took decades to get where it is. So creating a, a, a long-term plan, like what you're gonna address each year, really addressing, you know, what's the biggest hazard fire-wise, otherwise close to house and um, getting a multi-year plan, just thinking about it that way. No. Hey, Rich, uh, do you mind if I take one, one second just to address something that I saw come up in the chat for the <laughs> Q&A? Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I want to emphasize to everybody listening that, that, that again, that, that, that these, these things we're talking about, they're not black and white. It's, it, they're, sometimes it requires some thought. Uh, um, I, you know, there, there were some comments saying, aren't you contradicting yourself? You told us don't remove, or you told us trees are not the problem, but Fire Safe Marin's website says that the Italian cypress are a problem. I, I just want to be, be careful to remind people that, that we said that, that all trees are not a problem. Uh, and, and when I show a picture like the one from that fire in, down in Southern California of the eucalyptus trees <clears throat> that didn't burn, I, th th there are plenty of examples of eucalyptus trees being involved in a fire. So, so I, I, we, we oftentimes see these, these black and white assumptions that, that somehow if I say that, that those eucalyptus trees weren't part of the problem, then, then people see it as the, well, then I guess you're saying the solution is to plant more eucalyptus trees. We're not saying that. that uh, don't don't overinterpret what we're saying here. What we're saying is that, they, that oftentimes we're looking at the wrong places to find solutions. Uh, we need to be careful and thoughtful about our selection of plants. We do need to maintain them. Um, I, you know, I pointed out that those trees in, in that photograph were very well maintained. Uh, underneath the trees, it was maintained like a park. Um, I, I'm very well aware of the fact that during the Oakland Hills fire in 1991, uh, uh, several people died when they were exposed to the leaf litter and, and bark litter burning underneath the eucalyptus trees. I'm not suggesting that they're, they're, they don't create hazardous conditions, but those trees, uh, are, they're still there in Oakland, and, and uh, it was the stuff that had fallen out of them and built up on the ground that was the problem. That's what we can maintain really easily. Well, that's actually maybe a good place to end. We're at 7.15. That's usually our cutoff time. Bonnie, um, did you want to add any last comment before we sign off here? Uh, no, I saw a comment really earlier about the um, maintaining our, our native oaks and how we do that. You know, one of the biggest things is native oaks um, evolved without a lot of supplemental irrigation. So, you know, not having a lot of gardens around our oaks is uh, where you're irrigating, like non-native plants that you need to irrigate. That's gonna help our native oaks. And I also um, recommend allowing your squirrels to do your gardening, because if you want to regrow your native oaks, they'll do it for you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good note to end on. Take advantage of, uh, of our little friends out there. Well, again, for the audience, I hope you'll join us again next month. Faye Mark will be here um, and probably with some helpers from Rin Master Gardeners. And it, it, the topic will be far smart landscaping, kind of extension where we're going now. It should be very exciting. And I really do encourage all of you to show up. And again, I thank a very good attendance. Um, we're kind of in the middle of seasons right now, although we're coming up to the summer. And it was great to see all of you make the time to join us. And we look forward to seeing you all again next month. And of course, if you have questions in the interim, you could just send them to info at firesafemarin.org and we'll be glad to get back to you. So with that, I'll say good night to everybody. And again, special thanks to Todd and Bonnie for a very informative and helpful uh, presentation tonight. All right. Thanks, Rich. Good night.